Good morning and welcome to Sun Up. I'm Dave Deacon and we're coming to you from Cotton County, which is the first stop on the 2016 Canola Tour. We'll have a little bit more on that later on in the show. But first, here's a canola update with cropping system specialist, Josh Lofton. Well, the canola crop, as far as the state goes, uh, looks looks real good. Um, we we were a little scared here in the southwest for a while. We were getting a little dry. Um, everything was going down. The wheat was looking bad. The canola was was starting to kind of turn. Um, but with this this last rain, we we kind of have, have have turned a good corner and, and gotten a lot of good good moisture. The canola as a as a as a whole looks really good. Um, it's kind of needing that one less drink of water and, and you know this is a nice good drink to have. So overall in the state the canola crop looks looks real good. But the, the good thing is is that canola is such an indeterminate plant that if we have enough good conditions and we have enough season to stretch out it, it can finish out some more some more pods but uh, I mean as a whole uh, we the canola roots were so deep that we were still getting access to moisture that that a crop like wheat was not. So we were not as stressed as as let's say the wheat crop. It was still getting a lot of moisture from subsoil moisture that was still present, and still around. So we had a lot better conditions, and we filled probably out a lot more pods than than we would have if if we wouldn't have had that deep soil moisture. We're probably still a couple of weeks ahead of schedule. Um, this 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 part of the world should be flowering right now, and we see here it's it's loaded up with pods and it's kind of turning that corner as far as the season goes of, of kind of starting to finish off. So um, guys are, are that are typically looking at flowering and looking at aphids and, and etc in this time of year now to now need to start looking at their harvest and, and if they're swathing they need to start going out and checking their maturity and checking their seed color change. So it's, it's nothing detrimental we just need to shift our mentality of mid-April I used to think of this now I need to be thinking a couple weeks ahead of schedule. When it undergoes these type of stress situations, it's going to push the crop further along. It's the crop is essentially wanting to get out of that stress period, and and one way it does that is either slowing down where it was, or if the crop was far enough along, it speeds itself up and tries to finish. Um, so it probably sped up a little more, little more of the ripening and finishing of some of the flowers than it, it would have. But like I said, we're we're still in a good situation. We're still hanging on to some flowers, filling out the last bit of this raceme. Uh, like I said, we're we're, we're in that stage in certain parts of the state to where we're still looking at flowers and we're still needing to manage that. We're in this part of the state, you see here, we're, we're kind of finishing down flowering in, in a good portion of the, this field. So we need to start thinking about harvest and what my harvest options are gonna be and what I'm gonna do from there. Just wanna indicate there or stress, well, as soon as we get done flowering is when we need to start checking percent seed change. If you're gonna be swathing, remember we'd like to see it at that 40 to 60. We'd like to see it above 50% uh, uh, seed seed color change and so about 10 days after you finish uh, flowering is when you need to start checking that on a, on a week to 10 day basis so we need to make sure that we're getting out and looking at it especially if you're wanting to swath the field looking at it to make sure we're not swathing too late and, and can encourage shatter at that point. You can probably start counting your 10 days here to where you can start coming out here in the next week to 10 days to, to start checking on your, your pods. I pulled some of these off this morning they're still translucent really green so of course we haven't had any any color change yet even on the lowest pods but um, it's it's kind of getting towards that period to where we're gonna we're gonna need to start checking it like I said this is really a critical gut thing for the guys that are swathing the guys that are gonna direct cut and aren't gonna put it on the ground it's it's not as critical of an issue but it's still a good time to get you know start laying feet back in your canola fields uh, we should have already been there but if you haven't it now is a good time to start again Hi, I'm Al Sutherland with your Mesonet Weather Report. It's been a week of welcome rain across the state. Some areas had more rain than they wanted all at once, but fortunately even they avoided major flooding or injuries. It took a seven-day rainfall map to pick up all of the rain in the state through midweek. There were four areas with extremely heavy rainfall, the Panhandle, Tillman County in the southwest, South Central Oklahoma, and McCurtain County. Red-colored areas had radar-estimated rain amounts of over 8 inches. The orange-colored areas had more than 6 inches of rain. Light orange areas had more than 5 inches. Yellow areas had more than 4 inches. 
All of these rainfall totals were accumulations from April 13th through Wednesday afternoon, April 20th. In the higher rainfall areas, Idabel had the highest rain gauge total at 7 and 22 hundredths inches of rain. Tipton and Tillman County was second at 6 and 96 hundredths inches. The plus side on all of the rain was how extensive it was across the state. The blue areas with less than an inch were limited and no mesonet site recorded less than an inch of rain. Soil moisture has rebounded at a critical time for maturing wheat and canola crops. On a map of the seven-day change in fractional water index at 10 inches from April 13th to April 19th, we see a lot of dark green areas. These are areas with a significant increase in soil moisture. The east side of the state already had good soil moisture, so it doesn't show much change. Weatherford jumped nine-tenths, Freedom, Tipton, Granfield, Walters, and Ada jumped eight-tenths. Those are big jumps in fractional water index that only goes from zero dry to one wet. We can drill down to soil moisture changes at a single site with the Mesonet Soil Moisture Graph Tool. A graph of the soil moisture at Freedom shows how dry the soil was at all levels. The red line is the Mesonet's 2-inch sensor, the orange line is the 10-inch sensor, and the green line the 24-inch soil moisture sensor. At Freedom over the last 30 days through midweek, all sensors were on the dry side below 4 tenths. With the rain, the red line showing 2-inch moisture and the orange line, the 10-inch moisture, both jumped from extremely dry to close to near saturation in just a few days but the water never got to the 24-inch sensor, the green line. At El Reno, rainfall infiltrated down to all depths, wetting the 2-inch sensor five days before wetting the 10- and 24-inch depths. At the Walters Mesonet site, the 24-inch depth was already very wet, so there was just a slight tick up at the end. The 2-inch skyrocketed in just two days. At 10 inches, it took six days to max out. They may just look like lines on a graph, but those lines mean big differences in crop yields and growth of pasture, range, and hay. Farmers and ranchers love to see those soil moisture graph lines on the high side. Thanks for joining us for this edition of the Mesonet Weather Report. One of the things you're looking for when you're walking on your dam faces would be signs of any kind of burrowing animal. Of course, the burrow itself. But there are other more subtle signs like a pathway through the vegetation or a slide that might have been through the vegetation that might have been made by a beaver or muskrat. Uh, these guys typically will not leave anything that you can see most of the time except for that pathway or slide. They're going to start burrowing under the water and they're going to want to work their way their burrow up to the top of your dam. That's why sometimes when you're walking across the face of a dam or the top of a dam, you'll see an area that has collapsed. That's a beaver den that has collapsed, and that is a very bad thing. If anything cause, creates a pathway for water to begin flowing across the top of your dam, that's called overtopping, and that's a major way to have a catastrophic dam loss. The other way you can lose your dam, of course, is if water is flowing directly through a gopher burrow, begins to flow through a gopher burrow or through some decaying tree roots that have been allowed to grow on your, on your dam. Uh, that's called piping. That too is a catastrophic uh, way to lose your dam. So get out once a year and walk your dam faces and pay attention to what's going on. And if you see something, don't go into denial pick up the phone and call the Natural Resource Conservation Service to get their opinion. Maybe take some pictures, maybe flag it if it's going to be hard to find again, but be proactive, uh, be early in detecting problems and you will save yourself a lot of grief later on. The other thing to watch with dams and so forth would be the spillways. Your dam should have two spillways. The first place that water overflows is called the primary spillway. In smaller ponds, that's typically a trickle tube, but it might be an internal standpipe 
or a tower of some sort. You need to look at that structure, make sure it's not clogged by anything, make sure it's not collapsing. Next, you need to look for the secondary spillway, which is generally a broad, flat, grassy path for the extra heavy flows to go around the edge, or not the edge, but the, the go uh, around the, uh, uh, and avoid the dam uh, and exit the pond without creating a risk to the dam structure itself. Secondary spillways need to be very well vegetated. They are very vulnerable to erosion. If you see any signs of erosion, again, do not deny the problem. Take steps to correct it early before the erosion becomes serious. The outside toe of the dam is one place where erosion typically starts on a spillway. So pay attention to that any time you've had, you have had an overflow event. Daryl Peel, our livestock marketing specialist, is here with us now. Daryl, a lot of producers and folks talking about all the rain and hopefully an improving drought picture. You know, the latest drought monitor map shows that we did, uh, you know, backtrack a little bit on the emerging drought area and the emerging drought uh, zones that we had in Oklahoma. You know, the, the one rain event doesn't fix that. It took several weeks to get to that point. Um, but this does remind us that it's the time of year when we expect to, to get some rain. Uh, so we don't have a major problem now we still have to watch it and obviously if it doesn't continue raining we will get back into trouble but uh, in general we're in pretty good shape right now deep moisture was there all along for the most part uh, from both a forage and a crop standpoint so with the surface now getting some moisture we're, we're still in pretty good shape for the time being there's a new USDA trade report out that you're taking a close look at. What are you seeing? Well, you know, this, this covers the major countries that are involved in all of the, uh, the, the three principal meats. And, and so it's good to take a look at that and remind ourselves, you know, pork is the largest uh, produced meat around the world. It accounts for about 42% of the total uh, among the major uh, pork producing nations. Um, you know, broilers are second and beef is third in terms of that. Uh, you know, the U.S. is the, the largest beef producing country. It's the uh, second largest pork producing country and it's the largest broiler producing country. And then in terms of that report, what is the takeaway specifically for the U.S.? Well, you know, again, the U.S. is uh, is is both a major beef importer and exporter. We're number fourth in beef, uh, number four in beef exports. Uh, we're the largest beef importing country in the world. Uh, we're the largest broiler exporting country, and and we're the second largest uh, pork exporting country. And I think what this report really highlights for us is the fact that um, you know international trade among all the meats continues to grow on a global scale. It continues to be important, and and certainly it represents a lot of the potential for future growth in all of the meat industries in the U.S. and, and certainly for beef. Okay, Daryl Peel, we'll talk more again soon. Thank you. As we approach this upcoming spring calving season and those times of the year when we're going to have higher ambient temperatures, there's some research data here from Oklahoma State University that I think are of real interest to cow-calf producers that are going to use artificial insemination as part of the breeding program for their cows and, and heifers this spring. The research that I'm referring to is data that was collected by using rumen boluses that had temperature sensitivity sensors in them that were placed in cattle and what they found was that during the daytime hours as uh, you would expect the the highest uh, temperatures uh, in terms of the environmental temperatures were going to be in the late afternoon hours but as they monitored the cattle that heat load tended to continue to build and the highest core body temperatures that they found were between 6 p.m. and 11 p.m. in the evening. Often a time when uh, some cow-calf producers might be working cattle or might be uh, performing artificial insemination. I think we want to reevaluate that management strategy. Perhaps you had heard of the old AM-PM rule of breeding cattle artificially. And uh, that basically suggested that if we saw the cow in standing estrus in the morning, we would breed her that evening. If we saw her in, in standing heat in the evening, we'd breed her the following morning. Research 
on thousands of head of dairy cattle has shown us that we don't have to do that at two times a day. That one time of breeding those cattle will be just as successful. So if we see that uh, animal in standing estrus in the morning, we can go ahead and inseminate her then. If we see her in standing estrus in the evening, we can wait till the following morning and perform artificial insemination with the same success. This way, then, we can avoid those times of the day when we know that core body temperature is going to be the highest. There's other research that indicates that if we have elevated body temperatures at the time of breeding or for several days after breeding, that can have an influence negatively on uh, the reproductive rates or the pregnancy rates that we get. So, as we're going through this breeding season, I certainly suggest that we try to uh, time our management so that we're doing artificial insemination, whether it's by heat detection or if it's by timed AI, let's plan to do it as early in the day as possible. We'll have cooler body temperatures and I think a higher reproductive rate as a result. Hey, we look forward to visiting with you again next week on SUNUP's Cow-Calf Corner. There's been a little bit of chatter about some big news in the wheat industry, Kim. Let's talk about it. Well, the last couple of weeks, uh, we've got a 50 cent move in that KC July contract. And uh, additional good news is that the basis, which had been declining, oh, a nickel here and a ni nickel there over the last couple of months, it's held steady. And so essentially, the, the potential harvest price and the forward contract price for uh, 2016 has increased about 50 cents a bushel. So what's really driving that rally? Well, that's the, that's the $64,000 question. Uh, there was some chatter about uh, India. There was about 220 million bushels in storage that they can't find in storage. So, And that, if that's the case, that could lower our world ending stocks from 8.8 .8 billion down to 8.6. So a little bit, but really not much. I, I think it's the result of uh, maybe more freeze damage in Oklahoma and Kansas. I think it may be that the world's realizing that, you know, Ukraine had 20% uh, percent less planted acres. Russia, uh, production may be down 9%. You've got these little pieces of news that are negative supply-wise mm -hmm. that may, they're, they haven't come to fruition yet. We're not to the harvest yet, but they may be saying, hey, this is changing the odds of 2016-17 of, uh, world wheat production, and it, the odds are increasing. That's going to be less than we expected, say, a month or two ago. So why is there such a gap in, in, in the projected and then what they're finding out now? Well, it's, uh, you know, you go with what uh, has happened in the past. Right. And really, the current situation is the best predictor of, of tomorrow's situation, at least it's the foundation. And when you've had, uh, out of the last uh, five or six years, you've only, you've had uh, five or six record wheat crops every year, mm -hmm. and uh, still a, uh, a, a large one projected this year, well, it's just hard to change that uh, psychology that you're gonna have high production. Right. That low production is a possibility. And in all of this rain and moisture we've had across Oklahoma, what has that done to the the projected wheat price? Well, you'd think that uh, the rain says, oh, hey, more bushels because right. rain makes grain. Uh, and that, I think, is also good news because we've had this price rally right with and on top of and after this rain came down and improved our crop conditions. Uh, I can, I'm getting excited, but we're excited to, the price. The, the futures price is about uh, $5, uh, 65 70 cents off of that for a forward contract. You're still at 430 440 harvest price, which is relatively low. But uh, it's st I mean, when you've been looking at uh, $4 or less, mm -hmm. uh, 430 440 looks better. Okay, Kim Anderson, grain marketing specialist here at Oklahoma State University. And now we head to Cotton County where canola producers are excited about the field trials moving through their area. I love doing these tours and I'm because I'm a little bit selfish. Uh, what better way to find out what grows best on your field unless you have a, a variety test on your field. Uh, and then also I like to have it because uh, it gives a chance for uh, me to see it during the whole season. I drive by it almost every day. My neighbors comment, they call me up, what's this, what's that. 
Uh, when are they going to put the signs up? That's usually what the what big question I've got because they are seeing a variety that's of interest. And so this year we've actually been very lucky. I think OSU has actually put a, a test plot of canola on us and also a test plot of wheat. And then we were also blessed to actually had a Noble Foundation test plot on us that was right beside the uh, wheat test, OSU wheat test plot. So uh, we got a lot of things going on on the farm. I'm always experimenting, always looking for the next best thing. The, the filters, and whether that's a, a replicated trial or a demo uh, plot trial, and whether that's either canola like we're standing in today or wheat, uh, those these tours are very valuable for growers to get out in the field check out you know kick around in the dirt look see what works what didn't work look at varieties uh, you know being able to plant the right varieties on their farm that works for their farm you know and, and it and every geographic area is a little different there's varieties that work better in some places and not others so it's just a great, great opportunity uh, for growers to get out, get to looking around, uh, ask questions, talk with the experts on 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 production, and, and kind of see what works what works on their farm, and maybe something they want to try next year. Well, you know, we went from uh, famine to feast to famine to feast again. We had uh, really dry conditions when we planted it. In fact. It was almost a month coming up before we actually got a rain, so we were really worried about the stand, but we had a fairly mild winter, and so we uh, were able to get a stand. And then for most of the winter, we've got a little few drinks of water, and then later here in the spring, when we started bolting, all of a sudden the water turned off again. And I don't know if you can see it or not, but we're standing, we've had over two inches of rain the last couple of days, and so we're back to a feast again and we're seeing the canola respond and uh, trying to put out some more pods, which I'm very pleased to see. We're at least, you know, at least two or three weeks ahead of schedule. Uh, and that's gonna throw us into harvest being a lot earlier this year. And, you know, we always say the rule of thumb is uh, right after, you know, the pretty well done flowering, it's generally around three weeks or so. But that kind of depends on the weather, depends on the air temperature, how things uh, progress, rainfall, everything that we do here in, in Southwest Oklahoma and the Southern Plains revolves around the weather. And that's going to dictate a lot of what, what, how the crop responds. We're making a little bit of money and the key here is a little bit. There's not, the price is not great for any commodity crop. And so uh, we're going to be really challenged, I think, over the next couple of years of uh, finding uh, something that's profitable. Uh, canola always has a premium to wheat, and uh, so I think it's something that the producers need to look at. Finally this week, we traveled to Tulsa County where a group of Oklahoma State University fire ecologists are helping introduce fire back into an outdoor classroom. So this is a, a definitely a unique opportunity for high school students uh, here at Jinx. You know, it's probably the only, and definitely the only one in Oklahoma. Probably the only one in in the in the U.S. where we get where high school students are going to have an opportunity to learn about fire effects, fire ecology, and the impact of what fire does. And that's, it's going to be it's, it's it's just a great opportunity to have. Um, we designed a long-term study site for the students at Jinx High School, and then hopefully in the future, it will trickle down to the rest of the public schools so that we would be able to uh, have groups, you know, from kindergarten up through the high school coming out and doing, doing various activities. And my, my high school students in class, we do talk quite a bit about the prescribed burn process and the amount of planning that goes into that, the science behind it. Um, so to kind of educate them, and try to eliminate any misconceptions. Obviously, anytime you burn, uh, there are risks involved, but there are ways to definitely uh, reduce or eliminate a lot of those risks. To me, one of the bigger things that comes out of this is to show these students and stuff that fire isn't that negative, smoky the bear connotation that we've all been brought up with and, and grown up with that fire is important fire is needed on the land and you know, just all the benefits that can be derived from it
Researchers say that prescribed burning is extremely beneficial for soil fertility, and Yonkers students will be able to go out, analyze, and study the effects of it. The practice has been done in Oklahoma for centuries. Right. And again, Native Americans were the number one fire user. You know, lightning did have an impact, but Native Americans, so people have always shaped this landscape that we live in here in Oklahoma and throughout the U.S. But yeah, it was, it was huge. And a lot of these areas that we look at now that we, that we think of as, you know, scattered trees and things like that. You go back and look at just, just at the turn of the century, right before statehood, look at a lot of the historical photographs across the state, you know, especially even in this part of northeast Oklahoma. It was a treeless prairie. Very few trees could be seen in a lot of that stuff, and it's very unique to see that. And I think a lot of times when you show people that, and then show them, you know, and say, hey, the fire was why that, was, that happened, people start to understand and, and put things together that, you know, hey, fire is important, and we probably, probably need to put it back in the system and allow it to function like it's supposed to. I think it's an amazing opportunity. Not a lot of high schoolers, at least from where I'm from, um, had any type of opportunity, whether it was field work or just to burn. Um, so that's, that's really amazing. Um, early exposure is always great, especially for kids who are really interested in outdoors and want to get into wildlife or forestry or range management or anything like that. And I think one of my big motivations, um, having grown up in Oklahoma myself, is just for students to appreciate their natural heritage and being in where Tulsa is located, kind of a, on a border between the, the central irregular plains and the cross timbers, um, for them to under, learn more about that. But you have to appreciate the role that fire plays in those ecosystems if you're going to you know, really understand how those ecosystems function naturally. Well, that does it for us this week. If there was something on the show that you'd like to learn more about, visit our website, sunup.okstate.edu. And while you're there, check out our social media. From Cotton County, Oklahoma, I'm Dave Deacon. And remember, Oklahoma agriculture starts at sunup.